So we have a little bit less than an hour for our discussion. If there are interesting uh, uh, questions that are not answered, uh, I will make sure uh, to read them uh, aloud to our panelists. So I see Nabil, my dear colleague Nabil, already with his hands uh, raised. So I'll start with Nabil. So please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, uh, dear Anna Baulili, my director, and thank you for all the panelists, uh, all the participants. Uh, just uh, today, uh, we have discussed a very important issue, and uh, maybe I'll refer to Arabic because I have uh, did some questions, very quickly questions for all uh, uh, my dear colleague uh, in the screen. First of all, أول شيء ممكن uh, أنا أشكر جزيل الشكر كل uh, مقدمين الأوراق. وعندي سؤال للبروفيسور أوست ما هي الإجراءات التي يمكن أن يتم اتباعها لإحياء تطوير المدن التاريخية واقتصاديتها بطريقة مستدامة في ظل الظروف التي تمر بها المدن التاريخية أثناء انتشار فيروس كورونا وأيضا للبلدان التي تتعرض إلى لزاع مسلح هذا الأستاذ أوستا السؤال الثاني هو للأستاذ مداخلة للأستاذ كمال الموضوع موضوع جيد ورائع هذه الأنشطة هي فعلا رابطة بين المجتمع والمكان تاريخ المكان مهم جدا إنها أيضا تعمل على تقارب أفراد المجتمع فعلا أنت تعيش التاريخ في هذه الأماكن وهي فعلا هي تربط الناس وتعمل أيضا على resilience and peace buildings really يعني وأؤكد كلامي الذي ذكرته أنت وذكرته الدكتورة أنا بوليني لابد من التأكد من سلامة المكان والصيانة الدورية لهذه الأماكن وخاصة في ظل الضغط الكبير عليها أثناء الفعاليات ورابط المجتمع المحل المحلي وخاصة الشباب في هذه الأماكن مهم جدا السؤال الثالث الأستاذ فؤاد ملكاوي بالنسبة للاقتصاديات وتعزيز وتنشيط الحركة الاقتصادية داخل هذه المدن أفكار جيدة وجريئة وهامة لكن هناك مخاطر من التفكير إعطاء القطاع الخاص اليد الطولة في تحوير وتغيير الأوربان تيشو أو يعني النسيج العمراني لهذه المدن السؤال هو إلى أي مدى ممكن الذهاب في هذا الاتجاه دون التأثير على السلامة والأصالة وهل هناك محاذير معينة يجب أخذها بعين الاعتبار أثناء إطلاق مثل هذه المبادرات للإنعاش الاقتصادي في المدن التاريخية خاصة في المدن التاريخية لأننا على سبيل المثال نحن نواجه مشكلة كبيرة في مدينة صنعاء القديمة توسع السوق والقطاع الخاص حتى أنها تضررت المباني السكنية ودخل الأربن تيشو مع بعضها السوق دخل في المناطق السكنية المناطق البيضاء دخلت في المناطق الخضراء فهذه أمور يجب أخذها بعين الاعتبار لكي لا يعني تتعطل أو تؤثر على مكونات المدينة التاريخية المتكاملة الدكتور جورج عندي سؤال مهم جدا التركيز على عملية إنتاج مكونات الحرف التقليدية في المدن التاريخية وهذه هي ربط الاقتصاد واستفادة المجتمع المحلي فعلا من هذه الأنشطة التي ترتبط بالمبنى وما خلف المبنى كما قال المحاضر الأول إن هناك وراء هذه المباني التاريخية وراء هذا الديزاين الجميل هناك إنسان ولكن تتعرض الحرف التقليدية إلى تهديدات كبيرة جدا كيف يمكن أن نحمي الحرف التقليدية ونأمن استدامتها وتأمين جودتها وأصالتها في ظل التحديات الاقتصادية الموجودة إنتاج الصين إنتاج الهند الكثير جدا في هذا المجال الذي قد تؤثر على إنتاجيات 
القطاع او المكونات التاريخيه للمدن التاريخيه في هذا المجال. شكرا جزيلا على سعه صدوركم واكتفي بهذا القدر من الاسئله شكرا. Thank you very much, Nabil. So maybe you, we can uh, re reply in the same order. So, Professor Ost. Um, yeah, thank you for the for the question. Um, the uh, I, I think that we 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 probably uh, are in the process of a of a kind of shift in the paradigm that we have to see conservation and especially urban conservation. Uh, it's really struck me uh, when I listen to the successful uh, investment in urban conservation that they are mainly and I think that uh, Dr. Malkawi uh, explained that very well when we take the World Bank, you know, um, initiatives when we take everything that David Trosby and uh, Donovan Ripkema work. These are mainly macro perspective on things, um, international in a way that is more uh, oriented on tourism than on local visitors and also with a important uh, if not a too important involvement or intervention from the public authorities. So it's really depending on these conditions that basically were the conditions maybe 20 or 30 years before when, 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 when we largely rely on either um, money from the public uh, institutions or money from the NGOs or the or the, uh, or the conservation international institutions. What, what I really feel in a post-pandemic uh, world like we live here is that we can no more rely maybe on the fact that we get more and more tourists coming and we that we live in public spaces uh, in a way that we, we did it before. So the shift that I'm explaining is more from macro to micro. And we see that, that there will be also in economic terms a redefinition of the relocalization re also of, you see, the, the creation of wealth and the creation of, of production. What does that mean? That means that we need the participation of the community, as Dr. Malkawi said, but not only as a, a driver, but as, as really managing the thing. And that requires a lot of skills and a lot of change. The experience that we have, for example, to Salerno, and I think that Anna understands what you say, is that the local authorities intervene a lot about that. So when we, you make a workshop uh, with a lot of participation from the community, it becomes a very intricate discussion about who's deciding about what. And this is important because this is about urban planning, this is about st um, the strategy that we uh, should have uh, on a macro level, but it's important that there is a follow-up on an individual point of view, on a micro thing where people should develop skills as entrepreneurship, you know, a craftsman is an entrepreneur somewhere, and about defining the customer, defining, and what I believe is that we really, I'm an economist, but I worked in a business school, that we go from a, a, a cultural economics to more a cultural management. We go from the economics of the heritage to the business of the heritage. And business, business is not a, a wrong word to, to say it. It's just that uh, we, we need tool that uh, bring, that train people, that help them to take some risk about that, then, and then manage uh, the, uh, the different crafts and the different skills they have in a way that we can uh, basically have something more sustainable because the solution to that will be more closed loops, local things, recycle, um, 
cooperative economy and everything that we that we are we 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 agree probably that th these are part of the of the economy of tomorrow but it's it's not yet a thing there in in terms of really perspective or in terms of really uh, willingness to um, to um, to do to do thing the, the, the to do to uh, confidence I would say maybe or trust in the in the in 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 a human centered uh, policies. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we'll jump to uh, George because you asked the floor to get immediately after to make some connection and then we, we can pass to Kamal. Sorry, yes, if I may, just very quickly because I think, Nabil, your question to me is, is I, I, I can kind of follow on from what Professor, what Professor Ost was saying because I think we fully agree with the importance of this entrepreneurial approach to, um, to craft. And what we have done in Egypt, for example, we established a, a center called the Atelier, uh, Atelier Cairo, Art Jamil. And the Atelier is really um, almost like a, like a startup incubator, but 100% focused on craft businesses. So the idea is that we provide some of the things that Professor Oss, you were just saying around entrepreneurial training, access to finance, access to markets, we work with micro lenders, we work with banks, we work with um, online platforms like Amazon to give training and access to their platforms to craftspeople in order to give these, I think, absolutely essential skills to the community of craftspeople um, in Egypt. Because um, to your question, uh, Dr. Nabil, it's, it's not enough, I think, for us to support craft simply for the sake of supporting craft. It crafts has to be in, ha, have to be engaged with the contemporary world from a business perspective and indeed from a design perspective. So we teach in the Jamil houses in, in Cairo and in Jeddah, contemporary design inspired by tradition. And while on the one hand, if we're thinking about urban regeneration and the application of craft to restoration activities, that's necessarily deeply, uh, deeply rooted in the, in the tradition the production of pieces for the marketplace and responses to touristic buyers that has to have a contemporary style and feel, um, or at least an awareness of what is driving contemporary activities. And, and we don't see a, an, a, any, any paradox in applying traditional arts through a contemporary lens. So, so just apologies for, for jumping in and, and ruining the order uh, to the chair. But I just wanted to follow in because I think what Professor Oss we, uh, was saying fully aligns with our philosophy at Adar Jamil. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are still two questions uh, to Kamal. Maybe if you want to reply first. Sure. Uh, about uh, uh, the choice of uh, intangible uh, act to put on a, a festival, I think there should be something uh, called like smart programming in a way that the smart programming uh, uh, is not just about the style of the music to be presented and its links to the heritage and the history or the local culture but also about the technical aspect of the uh, presentation and what that show requires for example I mean I don't mind uh, 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 on a site like a Roman theater presenting a jazz band but what size of a jazz band and how much the theater can take? I will not present a 50-piece band. Maybe uh, those kind of parameters should be studied. I mean, I have seen, for example, the, the South Theater in Jerish Festival presenting Arab pop stars where the, the amphitheater becomes extremely crowded with people. You feel it's going to fall down. I mean, it's, a, it's really heartbreaking sometimes to see that happening. While this place... Okay, it can take Arabic music, but not that kind of pop star. It can take something a little smaller, a little uh, of a different size. So I'm not against uh, presenting a dif a different kinds of music, but I will not put a heavy metal concert on a Roman stage, you know, that requires rigging and trussing and heavy lighting and a crazy sound. Even putting artificial sound in those sides, the vibration of the sound can actually move big stones, you know, so... We have to consider a lot of uh, things 
uh, and I, again, I repeat technical things, what this uh, place can take. So there should be smart programming. There should be information giving to the organizer that this place can take only this and this and that. More than this, you are damaging the place. So <clears throat> uh, there is a lot to be done in this aspect, I think, as well as also on the seating side of the places. You can see that these stones have been built in a way where the Romans were, you know, great muscled people and they can, you know, step up big, big steps. But now the people are kind of more uh, spoiled, you know. They need a different kind of pathways, different kind of steps to go up and the way how they sit on the stones, I don't know. I've seen uh, uh, a man, a man uh, sitting uh, in the Roman amphitheater, like uh, the, the, the places where people sit are already cured this way. I don't know if this happened the last 20 years or 50 years or 200 years. I'm not sure. But I feel there is more damage have been done in the last 50 years than the last 2,000 years, you know, in those places uh, due to these events that are happening without a proper uh, criteria and organization. Uh, these are my points, you know, for, uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but um, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuad. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Nabil. I think every session, Nabil has a, a interesting questions actually to hit the debate a little bit. It's uh, your question is really about the role of the private sector and the role of the government, which is really uh, probably as ancient as, uh, to use Kamal's probably analogy, as the Romans, <laughs> more or less, uh, basically. Uh, and this is not really a question about heritage in particular. I'm an urban planner. I work with cities on city services, and this is really <clears throat> the balance, how to get this relation work better for the benefit of the residents of the city is really the critical balance. I can tell you, I mean, I worked in, in Canada and the USA on similar projects, and I can tell you about actually the debate that takes place in a room between the developer and the, the NGOs that are trying to protect a tree or a, or, a, or, a, or a heritage site, or even actually a pattern of life. So, so this is really uh, basically, the question that we all ask. <clears throat> so before I actually say a few, another thing about that, let me step back and say, please remember I started in the beginning by saying that actually everything now is different. So what I was talking about is really pre, let's say pre-January 2020. I mean, I'm gonna uh, probably after this session, I have at least two sessions where we're discussing about discussing the new normal and the new reality in cities because of, of, of the coronavirus. So the key thing here is the fact that everything we know is under scrutiny now. It's like we defended density so much. Now we're discussing, is density good or bad and how to control it? I have talked a lot about bringing the critical masses. Now actually this is an issue that is under discussion. So the whole debate, the whole narrative now is focused on the fact that hopefully one day we'll go back to what, what, what things were before, probably with few measures, not really to do a drastic change because actually the status we are in in these downtowns took about hundred, hundreds of years to get there. We responded to various pan pandemics. We responded in the history of cities. We responded to various wars, to various crises. And actually the fields of knowledge that we have are a product of these various things. So to come back to the question, whether actually if we survive this really, this crisis and come back to the normal, this relation between private and public is actually uh, is gonna always be a question and we will need to come up with it. My take on this, to come up with the answers to it, my take on it, there is no business for the government really to be the investor, uh, to be actually, the, how do I put it, the, the key player there. The government's role is a regulator. Their role is really to, to put the boundaries of, for the various players. There are various players on the table. It's not only the private sector. The community is a major player. The government's role is really to put the 
rules of the games so that actually everybody is on board. But actually, as probably Professor Ost said, where the money is going to come from? In certain places, it is coming. It is actually coming from the national government, the cases I, 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 I mentioned in Saudi Arabia. However, this study came because the Saudi government was saying, what are the economic impact? Why are we investing so much money? So, so uh, in, in other cases, like in Karachi, we, it is a World Bank uh, money, or, or, but it's still a government money because it's a loan and similarly in Lebanon. However, to be honest with you, what I'm looking now at in Karachi uh, uh, is, the, uh, is the only success story that I've seen in that city, which is really initiated and run by a community-based group. It's not really by the World Bank. It's not really by the UN. It's not really by the government. It is actually a community based who were able to bring some donors on board from business people within the city who have actually interest in that. That emphasizes really where the point that I probably emphasize toward the end, which is actually who are the people and the members of the community of the place? Who are they? How can we engage them? How can they be on board from the very beginning? In that sense, you bring a party that is probably interested in the place, more interested in the, in the place from anybody else. At the same time, the party that's gonna bring life to this place as well. So if they are actually, they come to, to, to that, if we come to that actually knowledge, then probably our, our, our initiative will be more successful. I have to tell you that in this case, we are learning from this community-based group in Karachi to implement actually on street sweeping, believe it or not, because after the Corona virus problem, uh, uh, cities don't even have budget to really clean the streets, cities like that. So we're actually trying to learn how this community base can be initiated again in order for them to clean up the place, not, some, not really uh, uh, do the initiative that they were doing. So, so that's the key point here is this relation is really need to be uh, 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 calibrated and everybody needs actually certain role to play that is defined and overseen by, as I say, the regulator in this particular uh, uh, case would be probably the, the government. The World Bank and other donors would come with money and then leave. It is actually the community that has to work out how this thing can be sustained and function as, uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fuad. Uh, I don't know if there is another of the panelists that uh, would like to take the floor. If not, I would read one of the questions in the chat box. Let me know if you want to have... Okay. Picking up on what uh, you were just mentioning, Dr. Please. Fuad, I mean, to get this lens and say the, 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 the COVID, in COVID, post COVID, and, and, and looking at this. Uh, uh, the Miriam is mentioning how can we work to protect our ancient site from gentrification and musification? Coronavirus decreased the request coming from the industry of tourism, and now it's a nice thing for the preservation of heritage. But how can we make this opportunity into a rational development and a sustainable one? So I launch it to the panel. I don't know if Dr. Fuad, you would like to reply to this or uh, as tourism, maybe Professor Ost. Oops. I can say probably a few words and then leave it to Professor Ost basically to, to respond. It's a, I mean, uh, I, my, my words are not really going to be the, the response to the questions. Actually, I emphasize this question because, as I said, at this point, we are rethinking every practice that we had before COVID. We know that tourism is probably one of the uh, sectors that, uh, that, uh, that was hit hard, basically, by this because of, uh, you know, nobody wants to go anywhere. So in, in, uh, uh, in, in that sense, basically, uh, once this crisis 
ends, most probably that's the sector that needs to be really revitalized, one of the sectors that need to be revitalized. How we can protect uh, the heritage from gentrification, from other uh, basically, uh, let's say, uh, negative impacts, that is the role of planning. I mean, cities who actually are not totally focused on be defeating uh, coronavirus. Everybody's focused, but actually cities who actually have a longer term vision, that's what they're doing now. Every city has its own actually uh, uh, circumstances. So these cities are now sitting down to plan for post-corona. How to revive the economy, not really just simply tourism, how to revive the economy while not really losing the, let's say the, the assets that they have in the process. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned also, we are trying to help Karachi to do that by coming up with certain guidelines how they can actually resurface after the uh, COVID-19. I think that is, that is my two cents of thoughts. If, if I may just add, I just completely agree with, with, with uh, Dr. Malkawi, just to maybe add two, uh, two, two, two remarks on that. The, the first one is that the, the question about, you know, too much tourism or too less tourism is a question that has been always there. It's not, uh, it's not very new. Um, tourism is never at the perfect equilibrium. You get, you need more tourists at many places and you get too much tourists at other places. And it's a question of balance. And of course, there is a lot of things done in the last years, in, including about managing historic cities and the guidelines by UNESCO and everything that are very useful and not completely implemented elsewhere, uh, I'm a CISO. It is just a technical question. The, the other one is that I think that tourism is not uh, the, the problem. The problem is more about the externalities, about everything that tourism provides as positive things and as negative things. Uh, and this, there, we should, I mean, uh, take into account or take into consideration with in the future where tourism will, I hope, come back again and, and, and travel uh, to internalize these externalities. So to really pay attention from an economic point of view, you know, that people pay the price where there is something that is going wrong. We should realize that most of the externalities that we have today from tourism are sometimes negative and they're not paid for. So this is an economic question that creates a lot of conflict and a lot of distrust somewhere in the, in the community, in the local community. Uh, so there is uh, maybe that the, the, the crisis that we have today is an opportunity maybe to settle also to that question. And there, this is where the local authorities, as said Dr. Malkawi, should be a regulator because it's up to the authority to deal with the externalities and to take that in charge and to correct this so that gentrification and mass tourism and um, uh, pollution coming from tourism doesn't happen the way uh, the, 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 the way it, it, it went in the, in, in the past. Well, thank you very much. I think I saw and I missed uh, uh, raised hands before. Madame Bejaoui, je, je pense que vous avez la, demandé la parole. Oui, oui, j'ai demandé la parole. Uh, 
شكرا كثير انا اشكر اول شيء المحاضرين لانه لغناء وتنوع المداخلات وكل المواضيع اللي تطرقوا عليها من يعني مهمه جدا بالنسبه للمدن التاريخيه وكيفيه التدخل لكن اردت ان اركز على نقطتين اول نقطه هي اللي تتعلق باعاده الاحياء وبالذات التركيز على ترميم المعالم لانه في ترميم المعالم في عندنا نقطتين اهم شيء انه يكون فيه عنا اليد العاملة المتخصصة لأنه معرفة الصناعات التقليدية وكيفية خاصة كيفية نقلها للشباب وكيفية تشجيعه على أن يجعل منها مهنته هذه مهمة جدا وأعتقد أن هذه النقطة من أهم النقاط اللي ممكن نتطرق لها في مبادرة مدينة لنتمكن من ترميم معالمنا بطريقة صحيحة والنقطة الثانية بالنسبة لترميم المعالم هي إعادة توظيفها فإجمالا نلاحظ أنا أقول حتى نلاحظ من تجربة تونس أنه الأغلبية الوظائف الجديدة هي تكون يا مطاعم يا أوتي يعني يا نزل يا بيوت للضيافة وكل هذه الوظائف الجديدة هي بالذات يعني لا بتكون مجعولة للناس اللي لزوار المدينة ليست لساكني المدن التاريخية وهذه النقطة هذه تربطني يعني تربطني بالنقطة الثانية اللي حبيت أن ترقلها هي موضوع السياحة اللي هو موجود تقريبا في كل استراتيجيات الحفاظ على المدن القديمة اعتقد انه اليوم بعد ما ما عشناه من اثار الكوفيد 19 واثار الكورونا بعد ما من اللي قاعده تعيش فيه عديد من المدن التاريخيه في منطقتنا العربيه من من حروبات ومن فان اليوم المفروض ان نعيد النظر في موضوع السياحه وننظر له ممكن بنظره اخرى يعني حتى نجتنب انه تصير المدن التاريخيه كلها مجعوله للسياحه ولما نقول سياحه هي سياحه اغلبيتها اجنبيه ماهيش سياحه ما 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 محليه يعني لاحظنا مثلا ناخذ تجربه مدينه تونس ايام يعني الحظر الصحي فانه بيوت الضيافه والنزل والمطاعم كانت كلها مغلقه يعني هي تسببت احنا في الاول فرحنا انه هي يعني اعطات شغل يعني كانت مورد رزق لبعض سكان المدينه لكن في الاخير اتضح انه في يعني مده شهرين او ثلاثه اشهر يعني فانه نرجع نعيد التفكير حتى لنصل الى مشكلة الجنتريفيكيشن انا اعتقد انه هي النقطه ناخذ بينا منها لانه الاستراتيجيات اللي احنا متاخذينها في اغلبيتها توصلنا للموضوع جنتريفيكيشن واكتفي بهذا القدر من المداخله وشكرا. ميرسي بوكو باولينا. Thank you very much, مدام عمال. Thank you very much. وشكرا جزيلا لكم لهالمداخلات العظيمه القيمه. انا بس بدي احكي بموضوعين، بدي احكي بموضوع الحرف التقليديه اللي فعلا انا بحس بهالفترات اللي اللي مرقنا فيها انه التراث الثقافي الغير المادي حظه اقل من الاهتمام في في مختلف الدول وخاصه بالنسبه للحرف التقليديه. الحرف التقليدية حالياً عم بتعاني من اندثار في العديد من الحرف وهذه مشكلة حقيقية إحنا بنواجهها ولازم يكون في إلها اهتمام خاص لأنه العديد من الحرف عم تندثر أو إنه العديد من الحرف حالياً عم يتم إعادة استحداثها الاستحداث مش غلط والمعاصرة مش غلط لكن كتير في من الحرف التقليدية ويمكن دكتور جورج يمكن بأكد على كلامي إنه كتير في من الحرف التقليدية عم تتغير الأصالة تبعتها حتى أحيانا بتم إعادة تدويرها أو بتم استحداثها بحيث إنها مع الزمن وتقادم الزمن عم بتغير شكلها ومضمونها ورسالتها فبالتالي هذا تشكل خطر كبير كتراث 
مادي او تراث غير مادي غير ملموس هذه هذا تهديد على اصاله هذا الحرف وحتى الحرفيين القدامى اللي هم من بيمتلكوا اصول هذا الحرف لا يتم الاهتمام فيهم فهون في عنا اهتمام او في عنا مشكله كبيره انه احنا لازم نركز على الحرفيين نفسهم على المعلمين بشكل او باخر باللغه العاميه المعلم اللي بيمتلك اصول الحرفه واللي بيعرف كيف اجت هذول المعلمين احنا لازم يكون في عنا توثيق لها في التراث الطبيعي ايضا فمثلا في عنا بناء السلاسل بناء السلاسل في التراث الطبيعي مثلا في عندنا في بتير عم بنلاقي صعوبه كبيره في ايجاد المعلمين اللي بيبنوا السلاسل الطبيعيه الترسز كيف انبنت بشكل اصيل بشكل قديم فاحنا بنستعرض هنا مشكله احنا لازم ناخذ فيها بعين الاعتبار ويكون لبرنامج مدينه دور كبير فيها بالتركيز على الحرف الاصيله المنهجية لا استعادة الحرف الأصيلة وعدم استخدامها بشكل خاطئ وعدم نقل الرسالة الخاطئة لإلها وعدم تحريفها عدم التزوير فيها وعدم المبالغة بالمعاصرة لإلها الموضوع الثاني اللي أنا بدي أحكيه بالنسبة لموضوع الوظيفة تبعة المواقع في المدن التاريخية المشكلة اللي عم بصير صحيح إن الدولة هي المشرع لكن الدولة بتحتاج لدعم بتحتاج لتدريب لكوادر اللي عم بصير إنه إحنا بننظر لكل موقع تاريخي منفصل عن المحيط أو منفصل عن المواقع الأخرى لازم يكون في خارطة للدولة بشكل عام هذه الخارطة بتضمن وجود كافة المواقع التاريخية الموجودة فيها ويتم وضع وظائف بحيث انه تكون النظره شموليه لكل الدوله، لا يتم النظر للمدينه بحد ذاتها او للموقع بحد ذاته بمعزل عن ما يوجد فيها، لازم يكون في عندنا مسارات سياحيه مرتبه موضوعه بشكل ممنهج بحيث انه يكون المسار يشمل كل المناطق في المدينه او كل المناطق في الدوله، مشان يكون الاثر في استدامة وشان تكون الفائدة كمان بتعم على كل المناطق ويكون في عملية تشغيل في عملية استفادة وفي المجتمع المحلي يلمس الفائدة من وجود المواقع التاريخية لكن بنفس الوقت احنا كمان ما نستغل الموقع التاريخي ونهلكه او انه يكون في نوع من الاستثمار المالي او التركيز على العائد المادي ومع تقادم الزمن يكون هناك في تاثير على اصاله الموقع فلازم يكون في عمليه توظيف مدروسه لكل المواقع التاريخيه خطة مدروسة لكل المواقع التاريخية والعملية الصيانة الدائمة لأنه إحنا بنركز على الترميم وبنطلع بس ما بيكون هناك في عملية تركيز للصيانة ولما بنتوجه للممولين بيكون توجهنا هو فقط مركز على أنه نجتذب التمويل لهذا المشروع لكن لحتى نعمل له صيانة أو لحتى نعمل له ترميم لكن ما بتكون هناك في فترة خمس سنوات من ضمن المقترح لحتى يكون في عنا عملية صيانة مستمرة ولحتى أنه يكون كمان تدريب العاملين وتدريب المجتمع المحلي كيف أنه هم من يتعاملوا مع السياح كيف انه هم من يتعاملوا مع هذا الموقع التعامل مع الموقع هو ليس فقط وظيفه المدير تبع الموقع اللي المفروض يكون مؤهل التعامل مع الموقع هو كمان وظيفه مشتركه ما بين المجتمع المحلي ما بين مدراء المواقع ما بين الدوله المشرعه وبالتالي هذا هو التوعيه اللي لازم تتوجه للجميع بهذا الخصوص شكرا لكم ويعطيكم الف عافيه Thank you very much. I've seen Mr. Abu Sada, you asked the floor. شكرا دكتورة أنا يعني سعيد إن أنا أكون معاكم للجلسة الثالثة النهاردة وشايف إن إحنا يعني بنتقدم بشكل كبير حوالين بلورة أهداف مشروع مدينة ويعني هتكلم في نقطتين أول نقطة إلى أي مدى إعادة استخدام وتوظيف المناطق والمباني التراثية والأثرية واعتقد ان ده ممكن يكون احد الاهداف اللي ممكن ان يكون المشروع اللي احنا بصدد وضع رؤيه ليه يكون في دعم 
الاماكن واداره الاماكن الاثريه والتراثيه في الى اي مدى يمكن اعاده استخدام المناطق والمباني ايه الريجوليشنز اللي يجب ان تكون في هذه الاماكن لان فعلا يجب اعاده استخدامها ولكن زي ما كانت بتطرح المهندسه امل ان الى اي مدى يجب ان احنا نحافظ وان البعد الاستثماري ما يضغاش على البعد التراثي والتاريخي ولكن برضو يجب ان ما نهملش فكره الاستخدام او التواجد في نشاط يخدم الاثر زي البيوت التاريخيه والبيوت الاثريه اذا ما كانش فيها استخدام وما كانش فيها نشاط بيتواجد فيه سرعان ما اعمال الترميم ويمكن احنا جربنا ده وشفناه في مشاريع كتير ان التطوير فقط وترميم المباني بدون استخدامها واحيائها بشكل جيد بيكون له مردود سلبي الجزء الثاني اللي يمكن انا سعيد جدا بالتجربه اللي طرحها دكتور جورج في القاهره وهو فن جميل لان انا كنت مدير صندوق التنميه الثقافيه في الوقت اللي كان فيه المشروع بيتم مع القاهره وشايف انها تجربه رائعه ان ازاي يبقى في جزء خاص بالحفاظ على الحرفه وفي نفس الوقت المساعده في تسويقها تسويق الحرفه دي وكمان ان يبقى في معاونه في الاستفاده بمفردات مفردات الحرفه في التصميمات وانها تكون لها مردود اقتصادي لاصحاب هذه الحرف فمشروع حرفه جميله بعتبر برضو ان ممكن يكون نواه لتكرار التجربه دي ودعمها بشكل افضل من خلال ازاي نوجد في البرنامج اللي احنا بصدد ان احنا نطرحه ان يبقى في دعم لفكره الحفاظ على الحرف وفي نفس الوقت خلق اسواق جديده وافكار جديده وتصميمات تساعد على الحفاظ على مفردات الحرف ومفردات التراث اللامادي وفي نفس الوقت يكون في فرصه لعائد استثماري وعائد مادي يعود على اصحاب هذه الحرف. وبشكركم جدا ان انا يعني معاكم النهارده للجلسه الثانيه شكرا جزيلا. Thank you very much, Mr. Abusada, for your comments. I have uh, uh, one comment from uh, a question from a chat box. So we keep uh, again on the issue of craft. This is coming from Ala Labashi. So is it about the revitalization of the traditional craft practices in historic cities and the challenge to encounter modern technology and innovative approaches while the historic fabric and the spaces of the old workshop are not adequate enough to house such activities. Are there experiences we can refer uh, in our own studies and attempts in historic Cairo? And I see that maybe George, uh, I will see you moving your head, so maybe you can reply and take that one. Thank you. Thank you to the chair and uh, thank you, yes, to uh, Dr. Ala. Uh, but I think yeah, it's, a good, it's a good question about the kind of tra traditional versus contemporary in materials and techniques. Um, it's something we think about a lot. So on the one hand, a core objective for us is to revive and achieve sustainable continued practice of traditional crafts. But on the other hand, we recognize that times are changing and there are differing requirements from the contemporary market and new technologies which can make production easier and more sustainable. So it's always going to be a balance between the two, especially to go back to what Professor Ost was saying earlier about the importance of, of achieving an entrepreneurial approach amongst craftspeople to the practice of their traditional arts. If we take an individual craftsperson, uh, he or she will be skilled and trained in the traditional way of making, say, ceramic bowls, ceramic plates. But is it necessarily wrong for that craftsperson to look to modern technologies to facilitate more efficient ways of making those bowls if it means that they'll be able to create a business which is sustainable and allows them to continue to practice that craft? Because oftentimes, I think we go back to uh, what uh, Madame uh, Bajawi was saying about the, the, the problems with relying too heavily on the touristic market. And touristic tastes 
let's be honest, sometimes tourists come and they're looking for a trinket, something relatively cheap to take home. And that's not enough to sustain the continued practice of heavily intensive, time intensive, effort intensive um, uh, practice of the crafts. So we have to find models which, which work in both worlds. And I think maintaining an open mind and seeing across traditional divisions between tradition and contemporary, tangible and intangible, um, uh, tourist facing versus local market facing, we have, to, we have to move carefully between all of these different, uh, different aspect points around the issue of craft in order to make it sustainable. I'd just like to pick up on something that Dr. Amel was saying earlier about um, the importance of making sure the craft is sustainable beyond, say, the donor's intervention um, to restore, say, a historic building. I think this is really a fundamental problem that is faced when we talk about craft, because to go back to, to my presentation just briefly, we think of craft going into one of two categories, either craft to support conservation and restoration of buildings or craft to produce products for touristic markets. And I think we have to think far more long-term about how do we revive crafts in order to respond to local markets that aren't tied to the restoration of buildings and aren't necessarily tied to uh, tourism, especially in the post-COVID world. In other words, how do we make sure that craft is sustainable in a contemporary way responding to local markets. And that involves everything from new technologies through to access to new markets via online practices, uh, teaching entrepreneurial skills, providing access to finance, many of the points that Professor Ost was saying earlier. But of course, keeping this ancient tradition of the practice of the crafts across different generations. Um, and I think through, through those approaches, we hope that the crafts as we, as we all admire them and, and value them from a heritage perspective can continue to be practiced in a sensitive way. Thank you. I see Kamal raising the hand, so please go ahead. Um, I would like just to make a quick comparison between the traditional crafts, the inherited traditional crafts and traditional music, because there is a really big uh, similarity. Uh, uh, seeing music also as a craft, you know, whether it's a playing an instrument, a traditional instrument like the oud uh, in Arab world or playing the classical guitar in, in, in the Western world. So uh, we, uh, in the music world, we have uh, documented the traditional ways of playing these things. So if I want to know how to play a traditional oud, then there is a way to know it because it has been documented about with audio references, video references, and written music. So what I suggest, if there are ways to document the exact genuine traditional craft where it is preserved somewhere as a reference, even though at some point of history, maybe in, in 50 years, we will never find any uh, master to do the craft again, but we can go back to the reference and learn from that. So uh, I take another example. How do Orchestras in Europe today play the classical music of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. They never met them and they never know how, uh, they never listened to them. But going back to the documentation of those, we can reinterpret almost the same way. Uh, so maybe if you take uh, the traditional crafts, if you look at them in a similar logic uh, and, and document them in video, in picture, in graphics, in text, and then you will have a maximum reference to go, to go back to, just in case. Because I'm not, I'm, I am for the development and for the using of new technologies and creating new uh, versions and fusing of, of cultures, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I do in my music, and so, because that's what is selling. But sometimes we really need to go back to the uh, exact tradition and 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 uh, give a hint of it or use it in a way or another, you know. That was just a little comparison. Well, thank you very much. I mean, the time of almost closing is approaching, but I would like before uh, uh, doing the final remarks uh, by Dr. Zaki and so on, uh, if the panelists can do a final remark, really two minutes on this topic that we have been discussed for almost the past two hours. 
So to, to sort of uh, wrap up the, the, the conversation. I'll leave the floor, whoever wants to come first, maybe Professor Ost. Uh, no, maybe just, uh, just a word about, because I, uh, I, I really agree with, with Kamal. I'm not a musician, but I understand very well what he does. And I guess that I'm not a conservation specialist neither, but that we have the same kind of question with tangible heritage because of following the, the Charter of Venice and all the guidelines and at the same time taking advantage of new technologies, new techniques. But the thing is to document everything so that we, we know what we, what we do. And I must say that it's not that different from coming back to my presentation when you look at the a building uh, to be adaptive, adaptive reuse. You see, you get the reuse there because these are the conditions for keeping the building uh, through different generation, but there is the adaptive word. So how do you mix these two? Uh, by having a, a balance between what the building can offer and at the same time, what the local community needs. And I know that this, this can be a discussion eh? because the Charter of Venice says, okay, take first the building and then look what the building can do because we don't need. But we need, I think, also for uh, keeping this building that we get this trade off and that we look at the clients or the customers <laughs> of the building and their needs and how it can fit better in the local community, in the surrounding. So this is, I think, always the same question about balancing, and this is what it makes things, I think, sustainable or not. And can, can I ask one question? I mean, I don't, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Fouad will not be happy with me bringing back the conversation, maybe through the lens of COVID. But you know, the, the economy, I mean, you, uh, Professor Ost, I mean, we have seen that the economy is really, you know, going down and the very steep and we don't know what's going to be the projection in the future. And we also know that traditionally investing in heritage and cultural heritage, I mean, it took many years to arrive to the point where Dr. Fouad was mentioning, you know, the revitalization of historic cities and making decision-making, understanding the value of cultural industries, the values of cultural heritage and so on. But we also know very clearly that um, it's difficult to um, um, convince the decision-makers and the politicians and the taxpayers and so on to invest in heritage. Uh, we are seeing that in in in, uh, in emergency situation, you know, where the humanitarian is also the first priority, and of course it should be, but that you know the the, the lens of, of of heritage is never there. So, what is the perspective in 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 the future, where already heritage is it's you know in the bottom of the priorities of any of the uh, decision makers? I mean, can we have any? Uh, positive regards in a way. I mean, we were talking a lot about the role and, and the community picking up really in, in their hands, you know, the, 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 uh, the sort, let's say, of, of, of heritage, whether tangible or intangible. But we know that also sometimes these people are the most disadvantaged as well. So they, they don't have the means and maybe they don't have the knowledge of what they could do. So what would be your final, you know, uh, you know, thought about that? I mean, in terms of, of economy. And then I will leave the floor to uh, uh, Dr. Fouad and, uh, and the other panelists to conclude. It, okay. To, to, to answer very, very, very briefly, because uh, that one of my topic is analyzing business cycle and ups and downs in the economy. There are downs, but there are also ups. So, you see, I remain always optimistic about the thing that could come. The only thing is that things go on, but on, in a different way. And this is where innovation and creativity also is an important thing. If you take something that 
keeps me very optimistic. It's not about, of course, the huge project that requires always some public decision and some, some maybe exceptional uh, measures. But uh, you, you see more and more websites of crowdfunding uh, these days related to heritage. And I could make a list of, of these. And I see there many examples where very small, I'm not speaking about outstanding cultural value eh? or UNESCO heritage, but very small things that has been done, you know, with no public money at all, with just the willingness of participants and uh, for very small amount, they can collect this and it's possible to do some of the things. So this is just an example of, I think, the changes of, uh, of time and, and uh, the, the, the reason why we may be um, uh, worry, worried about, about the rest is also because conservation has been a successful, a hugely successful story since the last 50 years. When you went to, you get a lot of problems, but at the same time, it's, it started from scratch in the, maybe in the 60s, and you get today a really awareness of the thing that we need to conserve and we need to do that. And so that remains me optimistic, even if maybe the, the means and the ways that we're going to take would be slightly different. And it's, of course, maybe the case that you come from Italy or people <laughs> when people come from France where there is a huge intervention, huge tradition of public intervention in conservation, in the culture, where this question could sometimes be more, you see, explicit than in other places. Well, this is a, a positive note. Maybe on that one, uh, Dr. Fouad, if you want to build in. No, I mean, uh, thank you, Anna. No, actually, I am. I agree with you, with your diagnosis. It's really, we are in, in, in difficult times. I mean, I am not an economist. I'm an urban planner. And my job usually uh, is, as, they, as one urban planning theorist put it, making sense altogether. It's really sitting on the table, uh, coordinating a group of people with different interests, sitting on the table to implement certain plan. And the, what your note is actually whose voice is louder going to be post-COVID. Usually the developer is sitting on the table, the government is sitting on the table, the heritage uh, passionate groups are sitting on the table. So actually it's, a, it's more of people shouting and my job usually was really to make sense out of it. And this is not really simply in uh, the cities that I just mentioned, even my practice in Canada was partly like that. And I can tell you 10 stories about that. So the key thing is really, is how, when we come out of this, COVID, I mean, crisis, and uh, basically, um, uh, hopefully, go back to normal or the new normal, whatever that normal is going to be, how we can actually make these cities more resilient. And by resilient, I actually mean also maintaining their history, their heritage, their past while recovering from the economic crisis that is hitting them. And that is actually not something that anybody knows at this point. It's more of another planning exercise that needs to take place. And I go back to the point that I mentioned earlier, is that we come to this point in knowledge and in city development after several crises, whether it's war, whether it's pandemics, whether it's actually, um, you know, uh, redefining of country boundaries, whether it's colonization, post-colonization, we, we build a huge uh, uh, body of knowledge and we have actually different techniques to deal with different, uh, basically, crises. At this point, I think, planning is what we need to resort to because the fight is not going to be government and public private sector it's going to be really uh, heritage versus a big corporation building a new project that actually going to bring a lot of money to the city in a time 
when the city needs it desperately. That's actually why I re-emphasize the community role and I add to that probably the public awareness because the government is weaker than fighting the developers. It's actually communities that should be strengthened to come up with a formula where they still can benefit from the economic development while maintaining their past and their history, basically in, in one way or another. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of you. Thank you for your uh, participation and active listening as well on this uh, very interesting debate. I think the word to move ahead is resilient, resilience. And uh, thank you also for having been resilient to, to, to this past two hours of this, uh, or two and a half hours of this uh, interesting debate. So thank you again, and I'm looking forward to see you in may the I week. Add, uh, May and I add just one quick? Sure, quick sure. Yes. You know, the human being is very ambitious by nature, and we all see now, you know, the, the struggle to go to the moon and to Mars and the technology and NASA and going there. I just wonder when they arrive to Mars, how much heritage they're going to find or, or how long it will take them to build some, you know. And sometimes we are living in cities on Earth where, we, where those cities have no heritage or they are newly built, like probably Dubai or some of these cities. And the first thing that people say or uh, criticize these cities with is the soul. They have no soul. So the question of the link, the soul link between the human and the past is so important. So I'm just wondering what's going to happen when we move to other planets. You know, we will miss so much what we have here. Okay. Thank you very much. In the meantime, let's try to conserve what we have here. And uh, thank you. So I leave the floor to, uh, uh, to Dr. Zaki to uh, the final uh, remarks. And thank you for your participation and see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Anna, for a uh, uh, very um, uh, really good uh, chairmanship of this uh, session. And thanks also to all the speakers, Professor Ost, Kamal, Dr. Fuad, and uh, uh, Richard, my dear colleagues. Um, I actually really enjoyed this session, this particular session, because it's, it's, it brought traditions and uh, uh, issues related to crafts together with economy, which I think is really at the heart of what we're trying to do uh, for the Medina Initiative. I think we, we started by looking at um, talking about, you know, uh, uh, keywords like uh, started with, Dr. with Professor Oss, cultural capital, then livelihood, then community participation, which we always talk about. I mean, all these things are always important. But I think um, one key aspect that um, came out of this discussion is perhaps one of uh, the comments that we received from Professor Ost as the economist and looking also with Richard on, on the traditional crafts is how we are moving now from, as, from an economic perspective, I think, from the macro to the micro and how we want to relocalize, re you know, the importance of communities and uh, entrepreneurship also in, in, in developing the skills of these craftsmen to develop businesses. So I think we cannot really separate these two things. I think these are really uh, important in, in what we are trying uh, to do. Then there were also um, comments related to um, talking about traditional crafts, but also traditional building crafts, which are, are important for our cities. We talked about partnerships and also the role of the different actors, um, the role of the government, the role uh, Dr. Fouad uh, referred to the regulatory role. But more and more, as we, we could have seen, and I think Kamal's last comment on the soul is really important because that soul comes with people. And this is what Professor Ost was also trying to highlight, the human-centered approach. So I think this is really important to look, look into how we develop tools to involve the communities and work with the communities to develop innovative solutions, because the word innovation came out as well, and how we could respond to current markets, which are not the normal markets that we used to have. <laughs> it's a different... Uh, situation now with the with the realities that we have 
and um, and I think uh, there were there were uh, last words that uh, Dr. Fouad used about the resilience, and I think these are really important in looking at how we could um, develop such strategies. And we wait perhaps for Dr. Fouad to let us know what kind of guidance you provided to Karachi in uh, after COVID, how this will be tackled. But also there is the issue of documentation, which I think is really important. Kamal referred to that which um, we need to have a reference of all these uh, traditions, how we could build on, on what we know um, to uh, develop practically uh, uh, to, to sustain, let's say, uh, these continuing traditions. So I think, uh, that, that, I mean, I cannot really uh, say more because it's, it's, uh, it's actually, it was a very rich uh, conversation and rich discussion. But I think this really will inform us for the last session uh, where we want to develop um, you know, the framework for the Medina program. So I want to thank you all. Thanks to uh, the panel, thanks to the speakers, and thanks to the participants who attended the meeting. And we'll see you next uh, Monday. Uh, and we will be talking more about um, the context and the environmental uh, dimensions uh, related to cities in their uh, cultural landscapes. So thank you very much and uh, see you next week. Thank you.